Abisava. What? Oh, you don't see my family here. I keep them in prayer. The enemy is at large. But we just want to thank God that He's able. He's able. The song I'm about to sing, Virgin, I want you to really listen to the words. And as it captivates your mind, you'll be drawn closer to the Lord. Why should I feel discouraged? Why should the shadows come? Why should my heart be lonely?
like it. I think it's working. Yep. Good. Wasn't, wasn't that a blessing? Oh, yeah, that was a true blessing. Thank you very much for that, Garfield. It's been a blessed Sabbath thus far. For me, and I hope for you. Christian standards. You know, I had lunch with uh, Ivan and George yesterday, and I shared with them that I was a little nervous about today. Just putting the title up there, I think. Um, create some question in some people's minds. What's this guy going to be talking about? Is he going to be pointing fingers, whatever the case may be? Um, I thought of a sort of a subtitle as well. Warning, the following sermon may contain content some may find upsetting. So I'll tell you right now, it's possible. It's possible. But I want you to stay with me on it. I'm going to say that a few times today. Stay with me. Don't abandon what I'm about to say. I want to tell you first about when I was in high school. When I was in high school, I remember a specific day. I can see it as if it was today. And I was in the hallway of a crowded high school, Queen Elizabeth Composite High School in in Edmonton, and I was coming along the side of the wall trying to watch and make sure I didn't see any administrators, which was tough because there was a glass partition here for the offices, and I had to scoot by there to get to my classes. And as soon as I got to the class, I quickly ran and sat down at the desk before anybody else was there. The teacher was there for sure, and I didn't do anything to draw attention to me. Why would I do such a silly thing? Because I was wearing blue jeans. Because I was wearing blue jeans, and you could not wear blue jeans to school in 1964. It was against the rules. There was a standard of dress that had one of our teachers be sent home because she was wearing a pantsuit instead of a skirt and a dress. That was 1964. Fast forward 50 years later, you visit schools, And who knows really what you're going to see. Certainly you're going to see lots of teachers in jeans. And you're going to see lots of children wearing other things, or in many cases not wearing other things. Things have changed. Things have changed a great deal. Standards have changed in schools, in society, and I would say they have changed in church as well. During the dirty 30s, you know, you look at when people came to church, it didn't matter how poor they were, they were dressed in their so-called Sunday best. Modesty and apparel and word and action were a must. Hymns were traditional hymns. And any talk or disturbance in the sanctuary was quickly dealt with by the officers in charge of the day. Things have changed. Things have changed. Church is different now. Church is different now. Now you know why I put that first heading down and why I was a little worried about this. I'm not saying that everything is bad today compared to before. I'm not saying we need to go back to all of the things that were there. I like wearing blue jeans when I go to school. But standards do change. They have changed. But I'm not here today to critique anyone's dress. And I'm not here to critique anyone's music. And I'm not here to pontificate to you about the standards you should have or shouldn't have. That's not what it's about. Okay? Stick with me. My experience, and you know it, many of you, is that my imperfect manner with words and and comments would quickly get me in deep trouble if I started to do anything like that. But I want you to stay with me. You know, and I say this because standards, these are standards, the standard of dress we have, the standard of music, the things that are acceptable to us, these standards for living 
are yours. You set your standards. You do, not me. I can't tell you what the standard should be. Your church can't tell you what the standard should be and force you to do it. You set your own standards. Christians, I believe, though, have choices. And the standards that I choose are my choice. The standards that you choose are your choice. The question is, have I really thought about my choices with respect to my spiritual life and what the Bible says? You know, in my experience as an educator, we had certain standards and we had to continuously examine those standards. Every year, we looked at the standards that we had, we examined the results we had, we saw where we were and what was happening, and we decided whether or not we missed the mark somewhere, whether we were using something that we shouldn't have, whether we were doing something we shouldn't have so that we could change, so that we can improve as professionals. We knew we couldn't become complacent. We had to keep growing as professionals. I believe the same kind of examination is useful. I believe it's necessary for us to do so as Christians as well, that as Christians we should examine ourselves and our growth as Christians on an ongoing basis. We shouldn't take it for granted that it's all okay since we once came to Jesus and professed our faith in him. That's not good enough. This world has a way of taking us off track. Any arguments? This world has a way of taking us off track and checking on our standards now and again how we live our lives as Christians can ensure we stay on that path that we want to, that we saw that was so good when we came to Christ in the first place. You know, 2 Corinthians 13, 5 says, examine yourselves as to whether you are in the faith. Test yourself, that scripture says. So as with my experience in education, if I can't see evidence of growth in my Christian walk, chances are that I'm standing still in my Christian walk. And if so, I am not going to reach the goal that I had in mind when I first recognized Jesus as my Savior and claimed him as my Savior. That's why I've chosen to speak to you on Christian standards today, despite the sensitivity of the topic. God does not want us to stand still. He doesn't want us to stay in 1964. He wants us to keep on moving. He gives us life, that breath of life that Jerry talked about that is so important to us, that breath that gives us that connection to him. He gives us that breath of life so that we can grow. Life, by its very nature, is growth. And if we want to stay alive as Christians, we need to grow. He is the vine. We are the branches. And if the vine should not grow, it will wither and be cut off and thrown into the fire. It is important for us to continue to grow. And so stay with me, please, as we look today at Christian standards from a particular point of view that I guarantee you will not upset you. Let's pray for a moment. Lord in heaven, dear God, I ask you to be with me. I thank you for the message that you have given to me that I have so long stumbled over. And I pray today that you take away the stumbling and give a clear passageway to everyone's heart, mine included, that we hear the message that you have given to us as individuals. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. All right, the old teacher in me is coming out. We're going to set the scene a little bit with some definitions. The first one is principle. Principle with an L-E, not your pal. Principle L-E. A principle is a fundamental truth or proposition that serves as the foundation for a system of belief or behavior or for a chain of reasoning. Whether you're speaking about secular things or you're speaking about religious things, 
principles, that definition of principle holds true in both. With secular things, such principles as a safe society are what we hold dear. In religious things, we hold dear the principle of Christ-like humility. Either way, if we believe in whatever it is, the principles are what are our foundation of belief. If I believe in the principles of biblical truth, I will hold the conviction based on our Creator God. If I believe... Oops, I stepped ahead of myself. Sorry. Um, okay, let's just go back for a second. Principle are based on what? Foundational... What does it say? Truths. Okay, foundational truths. The next term is where I was headed. Conviction. A conviction is a personal belief, a personal belief based on a principle. So we have principles. We have fundamental things that we base our beliefs on, and the, we have a conviction is our personal belief of that principle being true. So if I believe in principles of evolutionary science, for instance, I will be convicted to be an atheist or an agnostic. If I believe in a creator God or in biblical truth, I will have convictions that lead me to believe that God is the creator of all things. And I will see all that happens in the world through those eyes. Our convictions are based upon the principles we believe to be fundamental truths. The third one is where we started our sermon title, and that's standard. A standard is a guideline. It's a guideline or an approved model I use to help me understand my convictions. That's what a standard is. In other words, standards are a demonstration of how we value things, how we maintain and live out our convictions that we have to the principles that we believe. So standards are how we live out those convictions of the fundamental truths that we hold dear. The posting of a speed limit in the roadway is an example of a standard in this world. The speed limit is a standard that reflects the principle of society that the safety and well-being of the majority takes precedence over the rights of an individual person to drive as fast as they want. Okay? For most SDA churches, the belief in the principle of giving all glory to God, a principle that is there in 1 Corinthians 10.31, therefore whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. That is demonstrated in the standard within our church, our church right here, I believe, by the way that we don't show overt appreciation for special music and so on. Okay? We don't cry out hallelujah. We don't give great applause. Garfield gave a wonderful song to us, a spiritual song that touched our hearts, but we didn't respond in an overt way. Okay? We have a standard that we expect and follow within this church. Standards are essential. You can't maintain principles without having standards. However, standards do change. Remember the genes. Standards change. Many worshipful, very worshipful SDA churches in this world today have a standard far different from our own. I've been to some. It may not be where I'm comfortable because of the way that I have been brought up within this church in the last so many years. But it's a standard that they have, and it's worshipful, and it's acceptable to them. So standards are set to do what? To help maintain our convictions, which are based on our fundamental truths, the principles of the Bible. The question that I have begun to ask myself, and I invite each of you to do likewise, Oh, I forgot preferences. This is an important one. I forgot preferences. The final definition. 
a greater liking for one alternative over another or others, possibly but not necessarily based on principles. So preferences come easily. They change easily, and they represent simply what we like, what we feel we need at the time. So the question that I have is, am I living my life by standards that are based on and adhere to biblical principles? Biblical principles. Or do the standards I demonstrate through my life choices really reflect my preferences for living? That's the test that I've been giving myself in the last little while. And it's a test that I would ask you to think about today. Jesus believed in standards. Standards that reflected the principles he shared with his father. Remember when Jesus said in Matthew 5, 20, For I say to you that unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. Jesus is saying here that standards held by the religious leaders of the day were insufficient. They were misplaced. They were wrong. Not because they weren't high standards. They had very high standards but because they were based on their own view of spiritual life, not God's. They were not based on the principles of God's Word. Love. Standards that exceed those of the Pharisees and scribes will be standards that are based on principles of love, not just obedience. And at the same time in this verse, I believe he is saying, standards alone won't make us righteous. Standards alone won't make us righteous. Although standards are important, they are also elementary. Rather, it is the principles of God's Word that are primary. The power of belief is held in the principle, not in the standard. Unfortunately, scribes and Pharisees and perhaps some of us today have mistaken the belief, a belief that the standard can make one spiritual. You know, wearing blue jeans made me a good student in 1964, according to the administration. Standards and belief to some are equated to spirituality. Jesus said in Matthew 23, 28, The Pharisees appeared outwardly righteous, but within were full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. They had high standards. They may have followed all 613 rules and standards of the day that they had set down, but even that could not make them righteous. And today, a hip-hop, a hip-hop gangbanger does not become godly because somebody pulls up his pants, turns his hat around, and teaches them how to use the language properly. A prostitute doesn't become spiritual because she puts on a modest dress. A hell's angel biker doesn't become righteous by putting on a white shirt and tie and a wool suit and giving up his Harley Davidson. It doesn't happen that way. Spiritual people have standards, but standards do not make us spiritual. Standards don't make us spiritual. We become spiritual only when we allow Jesus to lead in our Christian walk. And it is in that walk with Jesus that we become convicted, convicted of his principles for life and thereby determine what the proper standards for life should be. It is that walk that we become convicted of the need to maintain standards that reflect and nurture our relationship with God. And make no mistake, your walk with Jesus must involve a well-worn path through the Word of God. Hearing about Jesus is one thing. Hearing about Jesus is one thing, but being with Him, getting to know Him as a trusted friend by spending time with Him in the Bible is another. The Bible contains many principles God has given through his inspired word. Principles that are intended to help us understand him and to understand his love. 
an incomprehensible love for us and to lead us along that road to sanctification. Principles that if we allow them to convict our souls will lead us to live lives by standards that reflect those principles. This morning, I'm going to take a very quick look at one biblical principle of God. One principle that he has put in his Bible. And I share these thoughts to encourage you also to consider your own lives and questions. This question in particular. Are you living your life based on and adhering to the principles of God's Word? Or do the standards you demonstrate through your life choices reflect your preferences for living? Matthew 5 and verse 13 is the scripture that I've chosen because it's so interwoven with so many things. In the ancient world, salt had a number of different functions, including serving as a preservative. When applied to the followers of Jesus, this speaks of our calling to be the moral conscience of society. But this high calling comes with a serious warning. In the words of one biblical scholar, R.V. Tasker, he said, if the Lord's followers are called to be a moral disinfectant in a world where moral standards are low, constantly changing or non-existent, they can discharge this function only if they themselves retain their virtue. In other words, we cannot change the world if we are not changed from the world ourselves. We are of no real consequence unless we are in some demonstrative way different from the world. A peculiar people who have been called out of the world. This word peculiar turns a lot of people off. It creates a, a vision in your mind that you're, you're like a dill pickle in the midst of a bunch of cheesecakes. You know, really, really different. But that's not what it means. Not at all. God uses this word a number of times in the Old Testament, referring to his people in the Old Testament. And it can be translated jewel, treasure, special. It doesn't mean we need to be harsh or bitter or so terrifically different than everybody else. It means we are to be different from this world as a special Jew-like child of Christ. That's what peculiar means. That's how we are to be peculiar in this world. This principle of saltiness, of peculiarity, speaks to many aspects of our day-to-day -day life. The world, the norm, is a me first. Look at me. Highly charged, sexually, morally depraved place. It is. We all know it. Turn on your television. Look at the movie. Pick up a book. Walk down the street. Go to a school. Go to a business meeting. Go out for dinner. If you're lucky, you won't have to tell the people at the next table to clean up their language. This world is a wicked, wicked place. Therefore, if we are going to be salt to this world, if we are going to be peculiar from this world, it stands to reason that our standards, our standards in life, which include dress, which include viewing, which include leisure pursuits, which include life in general, should be different in some way, some Christ-like way, than those around us. And it is going to be a sacrifice. It is not going to be easy. It is not easy to be different. But it is quite apparent, it is quite apparent that fashion standards of the world today in no way reflect the standards of modesty and humility that are so much of what Jesus taught. Ellen White said in messages to young people, my heart is pained to see those who profess to the followers of the meek and lowly Savior, so eagerly seeking to conform to the world's standards of dress. Notwithstanding their profession of godliness, they can hardly be distinguished from the unbeliever. Recent article I saw entitled, Sexy Too Soon, 
It was written by someone called Vicki Courtney. I don't know who she is, but what she says to me, I can see in this world. In it, the author asks the question, have you shopped for girls' clothing lately? Toddlers to teens are inundated with adult fashions. Pop singer Beyonce now has her own clothing line that introduces the red light district to the school lunchroom. Popular clothing items among teens include thong underwear and shorts displaying suggestive words across the backside. The abundance of racy clothing emphasizes the messages, dress sexy. Later in the article, she says that teenagers are being undo... This is, this is the kicker. Couldn't believe this. Later in the article, she says that teenagers are being unduly influenced by their parents who fret over physical experience or enjoy media laden with sexual images. Now, I say I can't believe it, but I do believe it. It's obvious. It's true. I see it. I've seen it with those people in my own family. I've seen it with myself at times. Parents are setting the example. What does God say about appearance? Jerry talked about 1 Samuel and the choosing of the first king. In 1 Samuel 16, 7, the Lord says, He sees man not as man sees. Man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. It's not the outward appearance. 1 John 2, 16 for all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh and desire of the eyes and the pride of possessions is not from the Father, but is from the world. And Ellen White in Adventist Home, page 334, says, I appeal to you as followers of Christ, cherish the precious, priceless gem of modesty. This will guard virtue. I wonder at times as our adherence to the principles of modesty and humility, which are enclosed, encapsulated, enshrined in the Word of God are those principles that God has given us given way to the preferences we have to fit in and feel good about ourselves? Does our standard of dress demonstrate our saltiness, our difference from the world, as special as jewels of Christ? Or does it more so demonstrate our sweetness, our comeliness to this world? Philippians 4.8 Oh, I think I've forgotten a couple things here. I have to touch it. There we go. <laughs> Philippians 4.8. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any moral excellence and if there is any praise, dwell on these things. Dwell on these things. I, the genesis for this sermon came because I have a struggle in my life. I love to read good detective mystery stories, especially those that are set in places where I've lived or traveled in Yorkshire or in England or in South Africa or wherever it is. If I have a, a detective mystery story that is set in those places, it adds to it, and I like those things. There are some great authors that write wonderful, intriguing, suspenseful novels, and I've enjoyed them for a long time. I also enjoy good mystery films, especially the detective kind. So I like Endeavor. I, li I, I like the old Morse series. I like Inspector Lewis on Masterpiece Mystery and Miss Marple. I enjoy watching those things. My problem is that it is getting harder and harder to find a book that I can read or a show that I can watch that does not have gratuitous sex and violence in it. And this really struck home to me one day when I was in the library. It's been bothering me. The Lord has been speaking to me for some time, but I was in the library once a little while ago, and I saw one of you there. I won't say who. You know what my first inclination was? It was to cover the book that I was looking at at the time. That was the first thing I thought of, not to say hello, but to cover the book. Why? Because I knew that this author wrote with inclusions of sex and language that were really inappropriate, that I used to just skim over. 
And I felt there was something wrong. I couldn't let that be seen. It was then that I realized that I knew in my heart it was wrong to spend my time with such things. When God has given me his word, the word of his prophet, and so many other good and honorable things to read and to watch. My standards began to change at that time. Does this mean that I am going to give up entirely reading fiction and watching television? No, I'll tell you that right now. But surely it means that I can choose with much more care. There are many people who write relaxing, good things that I could be interested in, shows that I could watch, that I could be interested in, but they don't include some of those things. Harder to find, but I can make my choice. Through the grace and power of God, my standards for what I read and what I watch have, in fact, changed. If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. Colossians 3. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passeth away, and the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. 1 John. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Romans 12. And from our lesson study this week, you should have read it. Do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity to God? Whosoever, therefore, wants to be a friend with the world makes himself an enemy of God. These are words that support the principles that God has given us with regards to how we live our lives as jewels, as treasures, as peculiar people. Ellen G. White says in Our Father's Cares, page 243, we are called to be the Lord's special people. In a much higher sense than many have realized, the world lies in wickedness, and God's people are to come out of the world and be separate. They are to be free from worldly customs and worldly habits. They are not to accord with worldly sentiments, but are to stand out distinct as the Lord's peculiar people, earnest in all their service. They are to have no fellowship with the works of darkness. And these words are spoken not just for our own good. 1 Peter 2 says, Be careful to live properly among your unbelieving neighbors. Then, even if they accuse you of doing wrong, they will see your honorable behavior and they will give honor to God when he judges the world. How we live our lives is noticed by others. Are you a peculiar person? Do your standards for TV watching, book reading, internet viewing reflect the principles of God, or do they lean more towards that fourth definition, the preferences that we have for our lives? And what do your standards say to those who observe them? What do your standards of life, Christian standards say to your neighbors, to your workmates, to your children, and to your grandchildren? We each make our own decisions. I can't tell you what they should be. You need to make your decision. We each set out our own standards. God, in his infinite wisdom and love, I emphasize, has given us that opportunity. However, if we are not careful, our standards of Christian life can slip into being more about our preferences for worldly pleasure than biblical principles. You know, I don't know too many people who like tests, but God's asked, God asks us to test ourselves as to whether we are in the faith. That has been the purpose of this sermon this morning, not to judge, not to condemn in any way, but to remind us, simply to remind us that the world makes it easy to be left standing as a Christian rather than walking as a Christian. Thankfully, we have a God who loves us, a God who gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. 
A God who, show, who shouts to us through his word and through his actions in our lives, if we look for them each and every day, that Jesus saves. Philippians 4, 13 tells us, we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. The same power by which the world was created, pure and sinless. The same power is the power Jesus is willing to put to work in your heart, in my heart, to help us in that walk. God wants none to perish. He makes it easy to receive that power. He says, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find it in Matthew 7. The way, the truth, and the life are all found in the world, in the word and in the world around us in many ways. But we need to be diligent, in other words, study to present yourself approved of God, rightly dividing the world of truth, the word of truth. God has given us the Holy Spirit to guide us. In Galatians 5, Paul says, walk by the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. And in Titus 2, we are told, for the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age. Training us means that we are involved in a process with God. God doesn't leave us helpless in this struggle. It is a struggle that I suffer from, and I believe that all of us do but he doesn't leave us helpless. God is with us. Now is the time to examine the standards of our lives. Now is the time to look at the standards we have. Do we live by the principles of the Word of God? Am I really doing it in what I do in my life? Walk while you have the light, lest the darkness overtake you. John 12, 35. If you abide in the Word you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. John 8. Do you want to be free this morning? Do you want to be free this morning? Then I encourage you to examine yourself. Forgot to put those statistics on the board, but you can see them now. Examine yourself. Examine your family and your life and the way that you set your standards and the way that you live. And I encourage you to examine yourself to God's Word, and hold fast to the principles for Christian standards that you find within the Word of God. And then we know for sure that Jesus saves, and we'll be part of that great day. Let's turn to number 340 in our hymnal, Jesus Saves.